Hello friends, have you ever wondered why is it so difficult to address environmental problems? Most people appreciate the beauty of our natural environment and care about other life forms. And yet, our environment continues to degrade and environmental problems are becoming increasingly difficult to tackle. This video series will help you understand some of the challenges and complexities associated with environmental problems and in this video we are going to talk about the free rider problem. To understand the free rider problem, we will have to look into some basic economics. Economic goods are classified into four categories based on how easy it is to access them or excludability and whether or not the use by one person reduces someone else's ability to use them or rivalry. In the excludable category, we have private goods and club goods. Private goods can only be used by people who have purchased them like a house, a car or a smartphone. While club goods are a set of goods which can only be used by people who have paid a membership fee to access them, like a gym membership or a Netflix subscription. But the use by one person doesn't affect anyone else's ability to use them as well. The important thing here is that there are mechanisms in place to check that only those people who have paid for the good are allowed to use it, making these goods excludable. For goods in the non-excludable category, that is public goods and common goods, the characteristic of the good is such that it is not possible to prevent people from using it. This makes them prone to the free rider problem, where anyone can use or derive benefits from these goods without paying for their maintenance. For example, in public goods such as national highways, historical monuments or the state fire department, the use of goods by one person does not affect their availability or quality for other people. Therefore, although the free rider problem exists in public goods, it does not threaten the very existence of the goods. This cannot be said for common goods. In common goods, also known as common pool resources, the use of the resource by one person can reduce its availability for another. For example, in a local commons like a neighborhood fishing pond, if someone with better skills or tools extracts most of the fish, it will leave very little for the rest of the community. Or in a regional commons like a river, if one region extracts too much water or builds a dam to stop the river flow, it decreases the other region's ability to derive the same benefits from the river. Or think of a global commons like the Earth's atmosphere or the global climate, where increase in pollution from one part of the world can affect the quality of environment for everyone. Since common pool resources are non-excludable and rivalrous, they are prone to a situation called the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy is that, in the absence of any rules and regulations, it is in everyone's best interest to maximize their personal gains instead of working together to sustain the resource for the long-term benefit of everyone. But why do people not cooperate to avoid the tragedy? This can be understood using the prisoner's dilemma model from game theory. In the prisoner's dilemma game, there are two prisoners, let's say A and B, who have been arrested for some crime they did, but the police does not have enough evidence against them to charge them for the crime. So the police decides to try to make them turn against each other. They keep each prisoner in a separate room and give them two options. They can either testify against their partner or stay silent. So, taken together, their options become... If both choose to cooperate and stay silent, they both get to spend only 5 years in jail. But if A stays silent and B testifies, then A gets 20 years in jail while B gets only 5 years. Similarly, if A testifies and B stays silent, A gets 5 years in jail while B gets 20 years. And finally, if both choose to testify against each other, they both get to spend 10 years in jail. In this case, if we assume that both are rational individuals and there is no means of communication between them, it is in the best interest for both of them to testify against each other. 
because if one was silent and the other testifies, it would put them in jail for a very long time. Since they cannot trust their partner to stay silent, they each choose to testify. The dilemma here is that both prisoners choose an option that makes everyone worse off with 10 years in jail when there was an option available where they could have been better off with only 5 years in jail. So, how can we use the prisoner's dilemma game to understand cooperation in common pool resources? Let's say two people have access to a common resource like a fishing pond where 100 fishes can be harvested in its best season. Each fisher wants to derive maximum yield from the pond. So, if they both decide to cooperate, they can divide the total harvest equally between them and get 50 fish each. But if they do not cooperate and one fisher decides to extract more fish, it would leave the other with very little. Another example could be a global resource like the Earth's atmosphere, which can tolerate, say, 100 units of pollution. If people decide to cooperate, they could all pollute equally at 50 units each and keep the total pollution level at 100 units. But if they do not cooperate and someone decides to pollute more than they should, it would make the resource unsustainable for everyone. It is important here to remind ourselves that the prisoner's dilemma game assumes that there is no communication between the players of the game. Remember, the prisoners were kept in separate cells, so there's no way they could talk to each other. But imagine what could happen if they could communicate. Naturally, they would choose to cooperate and stay silent in order to get the minimum punishment for both of them. This situation, where participants of the game can communicate with each other, is described using the theory of collective action. The theory of collective action states that a group of individuals can come together to work towards a common goal provided the size of the group is small enough and there is some external coercion in the form of a state law, an international treaty or a contract which forces people to cooperate. The success of collective action depends on how well the group can monitor activities of the individuals in the group like whether people are using resources within the allowed limits or contributing towards maintaining the resources. Usually, collective action works when group sizes are small as the cost of monitoring people's actions is lower for smaller groups. In larger groups, the cost of monitoring increases and it becomes difficult to collect accurate information about everyone's actions, making it easier for people to free ride. But external coercion is not the only way to monitor people's actions. A group of individuals or communities can also self-organize to make rules that allow them to manage their resources. This is the case of internal or mutual coercion. This is different from external coercion because it gives power to the community members to make decisions regarding how they want to use their resources instead of relying on an external authority. But what makes mutual coercion or self-governance work? This question was examined by the political scientist Eleanor Ostrom, who studied communities around the world to understand what kind of rules and strategies work under different circumstances that allow communities to successfully manage their resources. She came up with a list of eight general principles that, when practiced by the community, usually lead to successful governance of common pool resources. These are called Ostrom's design principles and we will discuss these in detail in the next video. So to conclude, we have learned so far that environmental resources are common pool resources, that is they are non-excludable and rivalrous, which makes them prone to the free rider problem leading to the tragedy of the commons. In order to avoid the tragedy, the best we can do is to cooperate to use the resources in an equitable manner and share the cost of their maintenance. But the prisoner's dilemma game showed us that self-interested rational individuals may not necessarily choose to cooperate even when it works in their best interest. Therefore, in order to cooperate, it is important for people to communicate to identify their common goals and devise rules and coercion strategies they can commit to. Finally, we must understand that there are no simple solutions to environmental problems. There is no one best way to make people cooperate. 
and therefore addressing environmental problems also involves understanding the people or working with the community that are part of the environment.